Uh, Jody just reminded me when we are on our prayer here that uh, Sharon Elrod's son-in-law, Randy uh, Keeling, has got COVID and double pneumonia right now, so we need to pray for him. Anyone else specifically? Well, is he doing fairly well? I'm sure he's super weak, but. Okay, well, praise the Lord for that. Doug Hughes. Anyone else? Okay, let's open with prayer. Father, I thank you uh, that you've given us this privilege, this opportunity that we can come to you. Father, we want to do that, first of all, praising you and giving you glory and honor, as Mike has already mentioned, Father. Uh, uh, Father, we can really give you nothing, but we just ascribe to you the glory you already have, and we just acknowledge that glory, that greatness, that holiness, Father, that sovereignty in, in all of these things. Father, we thank you for your, your work, and we thank you for your healing, Father, and I, I thank you. And truly believe, Father, that you still heal miraculously, but you also heal through doctors, Father, and you also heal, heal through time. So these things, we just uh, we also thank you for this too, Father. I'm reminded as I, as I re think about Daniel and uh, Belshazzar, Father God, that's in the handwriting on the wall. He said, basically, there's judgment coming because you have not acknowledged the God who holds your very life breath in his hands. So, Father, I thank you that uh, you hold our life breath in your hands. And, Father, that, that the... We can trust you, Father, and that you're for us and you're not against us. So we thank you for the ones that you have been uh, bringing out through this, Father God. And we lift up the families of the ones who have lost uh, loved ones through uh, whatever d disease and whatever cause, Father God. And we lift up uh, those who are sick today, Father. And we just pray your touch and your healing upon them. Father, I pray that you just reach down and you just touch, Father God, that you clear this, these lungs, Father, and that you just bring uh, healing to these bodies, Father. And I thank you that we can that we can come to you in, uh, in prayer and uh, to bring these to you, Father. So we just give them to you. Father, we just give you glory, and we just ask you to take this uh, message today and this study that we're beginning to do, Father, and just open our hearts to it. And Father, give us a, a new insight to you, to your plan, Father, to your heart, and mostly to your heart, Father, that we may know you more intimately. Father, we study your word. Father, not just to know facts, but to know the heart of the God who wrote this Bible. So, Father, I pray, praise you for that, and I thank you that you want us to know you. And we just give you glory, and just look forward to what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> We're going to begin a new study, but I'd, I'd like to, uh, before I do, to kind of um, give you a, a small synopsis history-wise uh, a short history of, of Paul and what his thinking was. But before we do that, I have talked about and talked, discussed with people throughout uh, my Christian walk and everything. Of course, you know, I, I focus a lot on teaching and so forth. I guess the whole uh, thought behind how you approach teaching and, and especially like uh, in a congregation uh, that's a large congregation or you know even today you know we're all at mat different maturity levels right I mean no doubt about that we've all lived longer some a whole lot longer than others some uh, just barely starting life and everything you know so I mean there's a wide variety here you know and, and everything in between uh, I realized uh Years ago, and I, it's even more so now, you know, that uh, uh, how we view age tends to change, doesn't it? I mean, I'm not really that old anymore, but really. But my son told me 20, 30 years ago, he said, boy, you sure are old, aren't you, Dad? You know, so it's really perspective, right? And uh, I'll be 64 next week, week after, week after next. And that's uh, don't even seem possible, but, it, you know. I feel like I could just take off and start playing basketball again and all that kind of stuff. Now, I know I can't, <laughs> you know. I know I can't do it, but I feel like that. You know, my mind says I can and all that kind of stuff, but reality says I can't. But, but spiritually, we're all in different, uh, uh, different maturity levels, and we've been, uh, age really hadn't got anything to do with it sometimes, right? Someone could come to know Jesus late in life, and someone who's been brought up in church uh, might be a whole lot more mature spiritually than that person, right? And, of course, of what we know and all that's going to change. So how, what's a teacher to do? How do, you, how do you teach when you've got all these different 
uh, ages and uh, spiritual levels and everything. I mean, you know, we have to do something, you know, but, but does that pre prevent us from doing other things? Does that prevent us from delving into things that might be uh, maybe some people never even heard of and everything? You know, uh, I talked to a guy one time, and his theory uh, was never teach above the maturity level of the least mature person that's there. And I understand the reasoning behind that because, you know, it might be, you know, overwhelming to them, you know, it might discourage them, you know. All these things we deal with as people, right? I mean, that's, that, that's all understandable. But my question was, so I said, so if, if that's the case and you've always got that mixed group, how do, you, how do you ever mature? How do you ever get into the deeper things and everything? So there's that side of it too. You, you understand what I'm saying? You know, so it, you know, that could be a problem. So I guess my answer that uh, I have been looking at uh, recently, uh, what, what did Paul do? What did Paul do? I mean, you've got to think about this too. I mean, of course, Paul, when he would go on, uh, Paul went on three missionary journeys, uh, spread out over several years, but not way, not, you know, not 70, 80, 90 years, you know, spread out over uh, 30, 40 years, I'm going to guess roughly, you know. And, you know, it's not like he hopped on a plane and went somewhere, you know, and but, I mean, he had to, they had to walk, they had to travel by foot, they had to travel by by ship, they did all this kind of stuff. They didn't have, uh, you do realize they didn't have this, right? Everybody, everybody realized that, right? They didn't have the Bible. Plus, Paul was dealing with people who may not have even heard much of the God of Israel. They had no background. He was dealing with uh, pagans who had a total different, it would be like us going into uh, Hinduism or Buddhism you know, who've never even heard maybe of the, of the gospel. Because really there was no gospel as we know it today, you know, right then. I mean, the good news has always been there, you know. You know, God, uh, from, from long ago, God's always been there. But as far as having a written gospel and everything, they didn't have it. You know, we didn't have a Bible put together as a Bible until 300 and something A.D., I believe. So what did he do? Of course, they had the Old Testament scriptures, right? They had Old Testament scriptures, but the Jews had them. So he was dealing with all these people. So what was he, what, really, what was he going to do? Most of the people that we talk to uh, are very familiar, most, you know, with God, with the Bible and so forth. Now, how familiar with the Bible they are, I don't know. You know, a lot of times we can be in church all our life and not have a clue about what the Bible really says, can't we? I mean, can we hear what, what's been taught? I talked to a person one time, uh, and, and they mentioned his fact, you know, they, they were... Uh, thanking me for, you know, teaching everything. So, yes, yeah, I was never taught that, never taught anything like that. All we did was go to church, heard a, a cookie-cutter sermon. This is their words, not mine now. Uh, kind of a cookie-cutter sermon there. Then you really dip, delve into anything, just a good, feel-good thing. And uh, that's, all, that's all they had. All their life, that's what they had. So we never know what the maturity level is. So what did Paul do? So that's what I want to kind of talk about as we begin our new study. Okay? And... Uh, to show what Paul did. So my opinion is, you know, you teach God's word as it is, whatever, whatever your study is. You go as deep as you need to go, and you trust God with the results. And here's the thing about it, see. If we're not careful, we tend to get very discouraged because, well, you know, that guy talked above my head all day long. I had no clue what he was talking about. Instead of listening Trust in the Holy Spirit to reveal what he wants to reveal at that time. Right? Do you remember, do you remember how long Paul left before he really started his witnessing for Christ? He, he accepted Christ on the road to Damascus, right? And then he, he stayed there in Damascus a little time, and then he went away to Saudi Arabia. To, to Arabia. You remember how long it was? Three years. Three years. And Paul knew the Old Testament backwards and forwards. But he went three years to spend time by himself, to relearn what he'd been taught, to throw away 
what I call Pharisee Judaism, what the Pharisees taught. And if you remember, the Pharisees were put what they taught above what Scripture says. So he had to relearn all of that, but he had, he had the background. But how did he get that background? Well, it, it, around probably around 13, roughly, he began to study. And bit by bit by bit by bit by bit is how he learned. That's how we learn. Most of us, it takes years and years and years. And in this study we're going to look at, I've been, I've been looking at this since, uh, uh, I don't know, probably 12, 10, something like that, you know, through the different teachers. But I learned bit by bit by bit and relearned. And uh, it's things I thought I believed I would throw out, you know. So it's a bit by bit thing, trusting God, you know. So my whole ideal is, and I believe, Paul, I'm going to show you, where I think I can, I can show you point blank where this is the way Paul did. He went in and he taught truth. And he trusted God to take care of it. He trusted God to, to reveal, to help the people retain bit by bit by bit and learn. Okay? So that's what I want to look at to show you, first of all, that that's what Paul did. Then I'm, gonna, then I'm going to uh, kind of introduce our uh, lesson plan. Any questions on that? Any disagreement? You can disagree if you want to. If you want to be wrong, that's fine. Any disagreement? All right. Paul on his second missionary journey. All right, so he's, he's, been, he's spent three years in Arabia. He has gone on his first missionary journey. Uh, he, he goes to synagogues first, to the Jew first, and then to the Greek, Right? Goes to, to Jew first. So he's dealing with at least some who are familiar with some of the Old Testament, probably more so with Pharisaic Judaism, what the Pharisees taught. So he's going and he is first and foremost arguing by evidence of Scripture that Jesus was and is the Messiah, the promised Messiah, okay? All right, so. On his second missionary journey, it's Paul and Silas and Timothy. Okay, it was, I think the first one was Paul and Barnabas and, and John Mark for a while. Paul and Silas and Timothy. So, in the process of their second missionary journey, I don't know, I don't know if we can say how long it has been before the second journey started, but our, he starts his second missionary journey, and they stop at Thessalonica in, in, in the process. Okay, which is uh, who Paul wrote the, the book of Thessalonians to, the, the people at Thessalonica. Okay? All right, of course, as was the habit, after a short period of time, the uh, Jews who would not accept what he was saying began to cause trouble. Right? I mean, it was pretty much the same pattern. And so he, he uh, Paul and Silas and, and Timothy, they had to, uh, they had to leave. Uh, and they and they left. They put they because the trouble was getting so great. They left at night and then went to Berea. Okay, so for, from Berea, uh, due to the fact that the unbelieving Jews followed them, you know, word got to spread, and you know, so they followed them there. And then Paul was uh, escorted to Athens. So during this time, uh, Silas and Timothy would break off and go back and. And kind of reaffirm and everything, you know. But then Paul, after Athens, went to Corinth. And it's probably at Corinth where Paul wrote the books of First and Second Thessalonians. Okay? And this is roughly in a, best we can tell, maybe a six months to a two-year period. Okay, so here's the thing. From the time that Paul went to Thessalonica, and begin to teach and to show that Jesus was the Messiah to Jews in the, in the synagogue and then from uh, other Gentiles that would that also come who had come to believe in God and then those who were, who were being saved who had no background. We're, we're looking at a period total of probably two years and Paul wasn't even there a lot of that time. He may have been there we don't know, three months, six months, you know. And then once again, uh, 
Timothy or Silas may have gone back for a very short period of time. So it's all just taking place in a two-year period. So what did Paul teach them during this two-year time? Well, we know, first of all, he spent a lot of time taking Scripture, Old Testament Scripture, and proving that Jesus was the Messiah. So is the Old Testament relevant? You know, we hear so many times today that the, uh, even, maybe even some denominations focus on it. They really don't focus on the Old Testament. But that's all they had. So I'd say it's very relevant, wouldn't you? The Old Testament, you know, the New Testament is built upon what the Old Testament has already said. So if we don't know the Old Testament, if we hadn't spent time studying, then we're, you know, we're, we're starting off in a hole already. All right, so what I want to do is also now is to show you, Paul wrote the book of First and Second Thessalonians probably pretty close together because he was dealing with um, most likely a forged letter that had been circulated. Paul had left, and somebody had come in and probably, it, it appears like, brought a letter, said, this letter's from Paul, okay? And said, basically, that this is from Paul, and this is what he's saying. Well, this letter was contradicting what Paul had previously taught, and it was causing a lot of trouble. We can only speculate as to why, you know. could be because they had very little maturity. They couldn't really remember. They only picked up little bits and pieces of what Paul taught, you know. They, they were probably undergoing persecution, all this kind of stuff going on with it. So it was causing a trouble, you know. And so Paul wrote First and Second Thessalonians to address these things, okay. Let me, uh, and I've got, by the way, I've got notes there for you. Turn to uh, Second Thessalonians. And I'm going to start with verse, uh, chapter 2. And this kind of tells you that what, is, uh, what the, the uh, problem was. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now we, request, now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you may not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. All right. So what Paul's addressing here is someone has come, evidently, forged a letter and has told the Thess uh, Thessalonians that they were in the tribulation period. The day of the Lord. That is the most common, and it's, and it's key in understanding when you're studying in times. The most, one of the most common terms dealing with the tribulation period is referred to as the day of the Lord. Day of Jehovah, you know, you get what I'm saying. That is specifically talking about the tribulation period. Okay? So, the Thessalonians are thinking... Due to this letter, the letter is basically said that you are now in the tribulation period. Okay? So they're thinking they're in the tribulation period, and evidently we'll see that Paul taught them they're not going to be in the tribulation period, that they were not going to have to go, that the church was going to be raptured. Okay? So in addition to the fact that Jesus is Messiah, right, that Jesus is Messiah, and whatever else Paul taught, he taught the Thessalonians about the tribulation period and the rapture of the church. Okay, do you see that? He taught them about that because they were having trouble. So there, there's, there's confusion here, Paul. This guy, this letter that's supposed to be from you says we're in the tribulation period right now, and it kind of feels like it. We've missed the rapture. So... So for, for, for a church, many of them who knew nothing about it, who knew nothing about God, many of them who were just steeped in Pharisee Judaism, he had already taught them about end time stuff. Think about that for a minute. How much anymore do, when you go to churches, uh, do you hear anything, anybody teaching 
about the end times of the rapture of the church or, you know, or anything about that. You just don't hear hardly anything about it. Why is that? Why do you think that is? Anybody got an opinion? Ellie, you ever studied it? Ellie's 15. Ellie's 15. <clears throat> She's never studied it. Well, why not? Well, she hadn't been taught. Why not? Paul did it to people who didn't even know who God was. You know? Some did. The Jews did, you know, but they'd been, all they'd been taught most is Pharisee Judaism. Paul thought it was necessary for it. And he, remember, he was only there a few months before he had to leave. But Paul thought it was necessary to teach that. So to me, that, that's a no-brainer, is that if Paul thought it was necessary to a brand-new church, just believers, that it's necessary for us today. Okay. Does that, make, does that make sense? Anybody see anything wrong in that logic? I can't. I mean, I've, I've looked through it and I thought about it and I thought about the different things. You know, Paul thought it was necessary. Jesus taught about that. Matthew 24, you know, it's full of end time stuff. So it's necessary, but yet we, and I can only guess as to why, you know, confusion. People not studying, people not really interested, I, you know, whatever the reason is. You don't hear a lot, pastors teach, there's a lot on the TV, you know, but as far as pastors, you don't hear a lot about that anymore from people I've talked to. Okay? So, um, what the study, what I, what I would like to do, is, of course we cannot even begin to do an end time study or anything like that, but what I'd like to do is, is just to focus on the rapture of the church. Okay? That's what I want to do. Uh, and by the way, I forgot my watch today, so you're going to have to stop me at the right time. <laughs> so, okay? <clears throat> so feel free to holler at me. All right, so let's, let's deal with the rapture. There are many different views of the rapture. Anybody got a view? I know you got a view. Somebody tell me what their view is. What do you think? Always got a view. <laughs> All right, so why not? Why don't you have a view? Or you know, you don't want to speak up. I understand that. What is the correct biblical view? I was I asked, first time I taught end time study. We did it in Sunday school years ago, and I asked the question. You know, basically, what you believe when you get to talking. Well, a person said, you know, I believe that the church will be raptured before the tribulation. Is what the person said. I said, great. I said, okay, tell me why. Well, dead silence. That was my fault for putting her on the spot. I didn't mean to do that, but it just kind of come out. So, uh, but, you know, we tend to go somewhere where we've been taught, or we tend to go on what we like. Right? Isn't that what we tend to do a lot of times? What I like is kind of what I'm going to tend toward. Well, that's all well and good if it's right, if it's truth. But what if it's not? What if the church is not raptured out before the tribulation? Because there is a total view that that's, that's the case, that the church will not be raptured till the very end of the tribulation. That's going to be a big difference, guys. Because what if the tribulation starts next year or this, this year or five years from now? Do you, Ellie, you think you might need to know that? I think every one of us might need to know that. You know, we're, now, there's no guarantee we're going to be here, right? But that'd be something that the church would need to know and at least have an opinion on it, to, to, at the very least, to see what's happening because God has not left us blind when it comes to these things. But for the most part, we've never looked at it and really spent time in it Maybe it's because we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. In other words, the rapture will occur before the tribulation. Well, I'm not going to have to worry about it. I'm not going to be here. But what about your friends? It might be important for them to know because they might have to go through it. And Scripture tells us it's going to be one of the worst times. Well, it's going to be the worst time on this earth it's ever been. So do we care enough 
to spend some time to learn, you know, for ourselves or for our friends. What about your children? What about your grandchildren? You know, we don't know. I, I, I think we can know, and we'll, I'll get into that. But all, the, all those possibilities, people believe in it, and, they, and, they, and they've got reasons to do. Years ago, of course, I was always taught that the church would be raptured, taken out, before the tribulation starts. And then at that, at the rapture of the church, the tribulation would start. Okay? Well, that's what I was always taught. And as I learned, bit by bit, piece by piece, I began to get questions on Scripture. Because whichever view you take, there's a lot of questions that have to be answered. And if I want to know the truth, I've got to look at it. I've got to be willing to look at something that seems to go against what I believe. Or if I'm not, I'm just saying, oh, this is what I like. I'm going to ignore God's truth because this is what it's easy. But what's easy is not, if you've noticed, sometimes the Christian life's not quite easy, isn't it? It's not quite easy. So I was always taught that, but I began to develop questions as I was maturing and as I was studying more and as I learned more and I, as I began to put things together. So I began to ask some questions to different teachers and so forth. And uh, some of the questions I asked, they didn't have answers for, or even to the point, some of them seemed to just kind of ignore the question because to answer the question at times without the, without the proper without the proper answer, would go against what they were teaching. You know, that's what we as teachers deal with sometimes. If you ask me a question, I say, say I spent all day long, all, all uh, hour long, teaching a certain thing, and you ask me a question, and I ask for questions, and you ask me a question at the end, that if I answer it the way it looks like I'm, I need to answer it, it's going to nullify everything I've said. Well, we don't like, really like to do that. That kind of makes us look bad. But it's important. Any question, any sincere question needs to be dealt with. If nothing else, say, I don't know. But I also begin to read some different books by different authors. And here's what I found out. You read a book, the author most likely truly believes what he is writing about, correct? And most of the time, he's, that's the reason he's doing it. He really believes it. He wants to convince people. And if you read just what he writes down, it's very, very convincing most of the time. Especially if you don't have a deeper knowledge. I mean, he's going to lay out verses. He's going to lay out scenarios and all that kind of stuff. And it's going to make sense. But the more I learn, and, and I don't really have a problem with that because it helps me to think through my positions. If I disagree with it and still read, it helps me to think through my positions. He may bring up some questions that I may need to answer. All right, so I began to read uh, after an author, and he basically said he believed that the, that the rapture would take place midpoint of the tribulation. So that being the case, and that means that the church would have to go through three and a half years of the tribulation. The tribulation is seven years. Would have to go through three and a half. Well, that's important if we did. Because there's a lot that takes place during that three and a half years. So I began to listen to him. And he began to make a lot of sense and everything. But then this little thing came up that he mentioned that I thought, so I said, I just totally rejected the whole thing. Because basically he spoke of reincarnation. Now, I won't go into all the deal about that. But see, that's a little warning sign to me. you know. So okay, he brought up some legitimate points. But this guy, from my perspective, was way off base. Because reincarnation was, was necessary for his belief. So that threw up a warning sign. So I kind of kind of went away from that. That don't mean he was wrong as far as his, his premise that it could be midpoint. It just means I disagree with how he got there. So at least I'm going to question it. And then I begin to read after some who believe that the church would go through all of it. And they made some good arguments and everything. 
But there was always something, once again, that they couldn't argue either and they couldn't answer. So it once again threw up a, a question for me. But the thing that really I had a lot of trouble for years, I had a lot of trouble for years with the rapture. And it was because of the question I asked that I'm going to deal with in our study. And part of what I'm going to deal with in our study is why I had problems with the rapture. I have come to believe that the rapture is the correct, pre-tribulation rapture is the correct belief. I'm going to lay out why I did, but I'm also going to lay out some of the problems I had with it. And I had a lot of problems with it. But one of the problems I had was I asked a question one time as we were studying from a teacher. And I asked the question, and the question was basically, I got, I got an answer like this. Well, you know, that's a good question. Let's go on. Well, my, my first thought was, well, this guy, he don't, well, he don't want to know the truth. So what he's teaching can't be right. Well, see, that premise was wrong on my part. He may not have wanted to know the truth, but what he was teaching could have been right too, which I believe it was. But he, he, he refused to deal with the questions. So we, you know, we got to be careful with that too. Just because somebody maybe won't, won't deal with a certain thing doesn't mean everything else they've taught up to then is not right. So that's one of the problems I had. And some of the things, uh, here's something that, that always I just never could buy into. Uh, heard, it, heard it from several people. God would not put his people through something like that. Okay, let me ask you a question. Is, does that sound right or wrong? I mean, we like to think that's right. How much has God put his people through or allowed his people to go through through history? Think about that. Think about believers in Jerusalem during the Babylonian captivity when they, some of them had, you know, the food was next to nothing. They had to start eating their children when they died. I mean, that's, that's pretty rough to go through, isn't it? Think about the ones who, who have been martyred, who have been thrown to wild animals who have been covered in tar and set on fire. Now, God wouldn't let that happen to his people, would he? But yet he has. So to me, see, that argument just simply will not hold up. It's something we like to hear, but that will not hold up. And somebody's given me that argument for the reason of a pre-tribulation wrath. I'm not accepting it because history has showed otherwise. Now, it wouldn't be on the same scale, Right? But it, won't be, it wouldn't be any less horrible for the one going through with it. So really, it boils down to what does Scripture say? I'm all for using logic in, in, in answering those questions. But bottom line, first and foremost, it's what does Scripture say? And that's what I want to deal with as we, as we look at the study of the rapture of the church. Okay? Any questions? Have I totally confused you? All right. One of the first things, and we're, like I said, we're going to cover Thessalonians, and I'm going to show you uh, for a, a couple of places that I've changed my mind, even one in the last 10, 15 years, because of a question that God allowed me to, to have. I taught a certain thing, believed it, used Scripture to back it up, then all of a sudden, one day, I got this question about what I was teaching. And I had a problem with it. It's, it, wasn't, it was not adding up. So see, that is, that is and I, I have since, I'm leaning to kind of change my thought on it. But see, that is why it's so important when, for you to have questions, to bring them up, not, not to be afraid to bring them up because... It might be something I've missed, something that I need to check out, you know, something that might change what I'm teaching. Okay? So please, if you have questions when we do our study, uh, uh, ask them. So there are many different views. Some believe, uh, and I didn't realize this until 10, 15 years ago. You know, I just assumed most people thought that, that uh, the church would be raptured and at least at some point. But there are some people believe that the church will be raptured before the tribulation begins. 
Some believe it'll be midpoint. Some believe it'll be sometime in the uh, during the seven-year period. Some believe that there'll be no rapture at all. It'll be to the, at the very end. Some believe that uh, Jesus will not set his kingdom up on earth. And some people believe they do. And, and there's all kinds of variants of beliefs in all of that. Uh, here's a problem that I ran into one time. Let me ask you a question. Give me an answer. I was always taught, or led to believe, or this is what I perceived anyway, whether it was actually said or not, I don't know. But my understanding was that the church, years ago, the church would be raptured, then the tribulation would start. Was anybody ever taught that? Jenny, you have been? Walter has been? Okay. Uh, I pretty much believe that. And I got to thinking one day, and I want you to think about this for a minute. Is there anywhere in Scripture that says that? There's not. Do what? Exactly, exactly. You know, but you know, it was, it was kind of it was kind of assumed, but that's not really in Scripture. What Scripture does say is that of that day and hour we do not know. Right? So the rapture, we don't know when it's going to be. Jesus, and we'll cover some of this. Jesus said, you know, only the Father in heaven knows. All right? Think about that. If Jesus said that he didn't know, that only the Father in heaven know, and we have clear signs when the tribulation begins, I got a real good idea when the rapture is going to take place. If the, and this is, this is the case. This, this scripture does say this. The tribulation begins by the signing of the seven-year peace treaty with Israel. If I see this fixing to take place, I know the rapture is fixing to take place. Right? I know it's going to take place. Because the tribulation is beginning to go, and we have been given many signs of the tribulation. If you read scripture for what it says. So I've been to think, you know, that's, that don't really necessarily work. So here's the case. The rapture may take place, and the tribulation may start right after that. But he doesn't have to. The rapture may take place. I believe the rapture may take place before I finish talking today. The tribulation may not take place to 5, 10, 15, 1,000 years later. The two are not connected. And I'll, I'll cover that. It may, it may be a lot easier to me too. Of course, I tell you what, after the last four years, I believe we can be told anything and believe anything from what the news media has done and what people believe and, you know, the, I almost said some stuff I shouldn't have said, the stuff we buy into. <laughs> so I understand that one about, one about the statement I'm fixing to make. But I want you to think how difficult it would be, not that it's impossible, I fully believe it's possible anymore. How difficult would it be for the church to be raptured and the very next day the tribulation start, and the Antichrist get up there and say, well, this is what really happened. You don't believe that other stuff. That's not going to make sense to me. It could happen. You know, he may come up and say aliens did it, and people buy into that. But it's going to be kind of hard to, for people to buy into that lie, I think, unless, once again, their heart is such a fact that they, they've totally rejected God, and God is... Uh, give them a reprobate mind where they can't even get, grasp truth at all and that's possible but there are things like that logically that just don't make sense with it but scripture wise it does not say that the tribulation begins with the signing of the covenant I believe the rapture could occur at any moment and we're not there for the tribulation yet all the signs are not there yet the tribulation cannot start yet but I believe the rapture can and we'll cover this. Okay? So, here's another question I've got for you. As we begin our study, we're just kind of talking through some things today. Okay? When, if I'm correct, and there's a pre-tribulation rapture, and uh, the trumpet sounds, and Christ comes back, and, and uh, the dead in Christ are raised, and we're changing everything, who is going to be raptured up? Of course, we know that those of us who are living will be, right, who accepted Jesus as our Savior. 
That will take place. We'll be changed. But it says the dead in Christ will be raised first. So Paul said, you know, they're going to, you know, they're going to, it's going to take place for them first and we'll, us right after that. So who does that include? That's my question. Ten minutes. So who does that include? All right. So the first question I want us to deal with, and we'll start this next week. It says the dead in Christ. That's key. In Christ. If you remember when I've, when I've been teaching before, a lot of things I've said, when it, anytime it says in Christ, in God, in him, in Jesus, it's talking about the church. Right? Talking about the church. All these promises, it says, uh, he made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's speaking of us, that we, once we accept Jesus as our Savior, have become the righteousness of God because I've been placed in him. Okay? So that's dealing with the church. Who makes up the church? That's the key. And that's one of the problems that I had because if you look at some other passages in Daniel, it's uh, the uh, angel told Daniel in, in chapter 12, said, go your way. It's not your time. You're going to go ahead and you're going to rescue your fathers and you'll be resurrected in the latter days. Okay? Well, in my studies, I have found that there's more than one resurrection. So when it says, Paul says, the dead in Christ, he's talking about the church specifically. He's not talking about Old Testament saints. He's not talking about tribulation saints or anything like that. He's talking about the church specifically. And that was a, that was a question I had and it, what gave me trouble at times. So, and we're going we're gonna to look at some scriptures on that. But if he's, if he's talking about the church specifically, who is he not talking about? What, when did the church begin? Day of Pentecost, right? So anyone before that was not a member of the church. Had you thought of that, that before? We're going to look at some, I'm going to show you some scriptures. I'm going to show you what uh, uh, John, the, John the Baptist said. You know, I'm not going to get, we're not going to just cover scripture after scripture after scripture. I'll leave that to you later on, but I'm going to show you some things that, that that was said there. So if the church began at the day of Pentecost, and that's, that is specifically who the rapture is for, then it's not talking about the Old Testament saints. Had you ever considered that before? Now, that doesn't mean, doesn't mean God's forgot them, right? I mean, their spirits, even now, their spirits are with Christ. But the rapture is not talking about the Old Testament saints. And I'll show you, you know, scripture-wise what we're talking about, okay? All right, so I'm going to quit there, and that's where we're going to start next week is who makes up the church and everything. So from what I've said so far, are there any questions? So, Ellie, you're going to get a chance to study the rapture today, the, this, this time. And if you're out of town, you get the notes, and you can look over if you want to. And I said, I'd love to have your questions. If, you, if you've never looked at it, I'd love to have your questions. And anybody else? Okay? All right. You'll stand. We're uh, sing number two hundred six. There is a redeemer.
Let's close. Father, I thank you for your time together. And I, Father, I just uh, lift this study up to you. And Father, I ask us, uh, that you teach us your truth, Father. And that, uh, uh, Father, any, uh, anywhere where I, I may be off, Father, and I know there's many things I, I still have many questions about, Father, that uh, in your time, in your, in your place, that you'll just bring these to mind. And Father, that we can stand on your truth. We can stand on the hope, Father, first and foremost, without any doubt, we know that Jesus is coming back. So, Father, I praise you for that. I praise you for that truth. I praise you for the victory in that statement. I praise you, Father God, that uh, you have not left us uh, without help, without a helper. Father, you have the Holy Spirit that you have placed within your people. So I give you glory for that too, Father. So just uh, uh, guard our hearts and minds this week as we uh, go through life. Father, I pray that you'll just open up our, our uh, consciousness to chances we have to witness of your love, your grace, and your mercy, that people will be drawn to you. Father, thank you for each one here. Thank you for their families and their lives and what they mean to me. And Father, I give you honor and glory and praise. And these things I ask, I thank you for in the name that stands above all names, the name of Jesus. Amen.